Wild Health is about optimizing you. We use genomics, blood work, biometrics, microbiome assessment, many other tests, and a conversation with you to come up with a full health optimization plan. What's the perfect diet, exercise, and supplement plan for you and only you? The Wild Health Podcast is about optimizing all of us. Here we cover the cutting-edge science that gives you the base to be able to apply the personalized plan we give you as a patient. To sign up as a patient, go to wildhealth.com. Or if you're a physician or health coach and you want to learn how to do this for your patients, we're happy to help as well. Wildhealth.com for all the information on becoming a patient or working with us. Hey, Caitlin, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. I am uh, in full-on winter in Steamboat. It's... uh... I'm actually a little concerned in my little studio that the uh, I've got like two to three feet on my roof right here, and I'm worried if <laughs> if I suddenly go offline, you know what happened? The roof collapsed. <laughs> little local avalanche of sorts. Yeah, I just like I got you. <laughs> Carl gets buried. Um, That's it. Yeah. So That's it. well, um, so <laughs> Kaylin Johnson. So you were on our, you were on our um, our fellowship. I think you, have you done our fellowship a couple yeah. times? And it's it's a super popular popular lecture with our fellows, so we is, really appreciate it. And yeah. we thought we'd have you on Thank the you. podcast at some point. So I'm going to do a little intro yeah. for you, so and then set the stage for you, and then kind of ask you some questions if that sounds all right. All right. So Kayla Johnson is a healthcare provider and a patient advocate and an entrepreneur. Um, so she her background is as a licensed clinical pharmacist and a functional medicine and wellness coach, and works as a healthcare advocate and a neurodivergent mentor. So she bridges the gap between mental and physical health through her professional and personal experiences. So she shows high achieving neurodivergent and hypermobile individuals how to unmask their health and feel their best through concierge whole person care. And so Kaylin brings this really unique perspective on to her private practice, but from living as a queer, late diagnosed ADHD and uh, autistic individual with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So with this perspective, like she coaches her and mentors other neurodivergent and hypermobile individuals to navigate the world that we live in. So Kaylin, like when you gave a lecture to the fellowship, you, you talked about, um, uh, like neurodivergence and the associate, one of the things you brought up was the associations with comorbidities like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And at your discussion around that just kind of blew my mind. And I, I spent some time like researching that and was just like kind of really like taken aback by that. But I think we should probably start with like, what is, so explain neurodivergence and why that is important for not just people, you know, to Rep, you know, think are, like, are they under this neurodivergent category or, and, but also for all people to kind of know and be able to describe and understand? Yeah, it's a great question and great place to start. So neurodivergent as a term actually has been around for a while, but the definition of it has kind of morphed over the years. And currently what we really neurodivergent means is a mind that functions in a way that doesn't fit into neuronormative standards. So it's an umbrella term for anyone who's functioning is labeled as atypical. So that's going to go beyond the biological to the human in front of you. And that umbrella term includes both the genetic conditions as well as those that are acquired or developed. So it's an identity really to explain how our minds diverge from the norm of that being independent or disordered. So it's not just ADHD, it's not just autism, though that's where my personal experience has been and my education is, so it's what I speak to a lot. But that also includes people with PTSD, um, OCD, bipolar, dyslexia, sensory processing disorder, or anyone who just identifies as their process being atypical from the norm. Wow. So that, I mean, that that's kind of an all-encompassing thing. And so- yeah. I, th- I think you and I talked about this, but I, maybe you could touch base on this a little more. Like a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of the, I don't know, like, I don't know what governing bodies exist, but um, governing bodies are kind of like putting this umbrella term 
over like a, a lot of different disorders. So like ADHD, yep. autism, those are the like the two, but uh, okay. sensory processing disorders, okay. um, uh, you know, auditory and, and tactile sensory processing, retained reflexes, all these things that that we are trying to put labels to, but they're so individualistic yeah. that, it's, it, that it's, it's sort of hard to describe yeah. exactly. Okay. So what... Is is though is the governing body the people that oversee these see these kind of um, diagnostic and laying out these diagnostic criteria? Are they are they transitioning to this more umbrella terminology um, for people's understanding and then just kind of individualizing man individually managing people? Or how's that working right now? I would say that's exactly how people are, for the most part, operating. I will say there's a huge discrepancy right now between the the DSM, the diagnostic uh, manual, really trying to help us identify who these patients are uh, who specifically fit into these more nuanced diagnoses that we have. And what we've really recognized is those diagnoses have told a one patient narrative. And most of that narrative has been young white boys. And yeah. identifying young white boys who are ADHD autistic, we found is very, very different than identifying people of any other sort of uh, nuanced group. So right now, I feel like the DSM is kind of trying to play catch up to figure out how do we identify? And then also, are there even more nuanced def definitions or diagnoses apart from that? And I think that's really what we found is so right now. We're dumping a ton of people into these two different categories, but recognizing that even within those categories, each person is so different for so many different reasons, whether they're other diagnoses, other experiences they've had, trauma, whatnot, um, physical conditions, uh, as well as they really are a spectrum of how they present. So we've got the diagnosis really to help the practitioner guide treatment for the patient and really utilizing the patient too to see what they find helpful. And when they find understanding their brain in these ways helpful, using what we know around these diagnoses then to help us guide treatment in a way that's going to be most beneficial for them. Yeah, it's, it sort of reminds me of, uh, so I like when you talk about symptoms of a heart attack, uh, all the symptoms of a heart attack were described in the like 1940s or 50s in 60 year old white men. Yeah. And it turns out there's other people in the world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but so what, why is this, why is it so misunderstood? I, I, first of all, what are some of the widespread sort of misunderstandings around neurodivergence? And then where do you think that comes from? Oh my gosh, yes. So many. Um, there is a book, if anybody ever wants to dive in, one of my favorite books on this topic is by an author named Steve Silberman, and it's called Neurotribes. And he talks all yeah. about the history, especially of autism. And there's so much even tied into the myths and the history, actually, with the Second World War and Hans Asperger being uh, of Austrian descent and his kind of studies of this specific group of autism that basically got kind of lost because of the Second World War. And then even post oh. that, people didn't even want to read articles um, uh, science research articles written in German. So there's even like this whole underlying part of like kind of the disappearance of identifying these group of people and then the resurgence of that has blocked a lot of that. And so some of the myths that I see the most common is number one is everyone who is neurodivergent has the same needs, struggles, and experience. I always say if you've met one person with ADHD yeah. or one autistic person, you've met one. They cannot yeah. be generalized. And we also know there was a study that came out, gosh, maybe it was about a year or so ago um, from UCLA looking at the differences in autistic brains from non-autistic brains. And we found that one of the main areas they differed in was in the area of sensory processing. And one thing that was really interesting, too, is when you stacked autistic brains on top of each other, we found that, that not only were they wired different from non-autistic brains, but they were wired different from each other. So even every autistic person and how they experience the world is very different. That's not necessarily the case for people. The term that we use for non-autistic people is allistic. So allistic people's brains tend to be wired in that sensory processing very similar. So that's one huge myth. 
Another one that I get a lot is that neurodivergence or neurodiversity is something to cure. It's a variance, not a disease. They just have different needs to thrive. I always say it's a little like having two different plants out on your patio and, you know, one, you put them both in the same amount of sunlight, water, uh, same type of soil. And when one starts to wilt, you don't say you're lazy, you're disordered, you're diseased. You say you need something different to thrive. Let's adjust the environment to support you. Yeah. And it may be more or less water. Yep. <laughs> Who knows? And that's right. different for each person. So. And one of the other ones that I get a lot now, I even just got asked this over Christmas by uh, somebody in the extended family, which is why is neurodivergence seem to be new or trendy? So <laughs> while the term neurodiverse may be new and a more broad definition than it was first used as, um, neurodivergent people have always been around. This has just helped us to have language that helps us understand our difference, which then helps us care for ourselves because linguistics and language are how we actually put context to our world and ourselves. Do you, do you think that the changes in just society and how we, our uh, attention is sort of stolen from us on a chronic basis also is kind of unroofing more of this as well? Hundred percent. The uh, the access or the constant dopamine barrage that yeah. is in our faces all of the time has definitely made a lot of people with these issues kind of come to fruition um, and uh, really hit a point. I also think that um, COVID, both the experience <laughs> <laughs> during COVID, plus what we're seeing yeah. in long COVID symptoms lowering cortisol, lowering stress resilience, um, things like that uh, are really making people who once were able to maybe have coping mechanisms that made it so they didn't really even ever have to identify this in themselves are now like, oh, wait, OK, this is a thing and I need help with this. Yeah, it sort of makes me think of that. If you read the book uh, Stolen Focus by Johan Hari, mm -hmm. yeah, so it makes me kind of think of his his sort of take on things like that. But I I also, you know, I, I think that has sort of unmasked some of these things, but I, I wanted you to talk about the concept of masking in, yeah. in these patients. Cause I, I mean, I think that makes it so clear to me, but I had some also follow-up questions to that, but I'd love yeah. to hear your talk about that. Yes. Love, like so much of my work is about helping neurodivergent people unmask. So when we use the term masking, we're referring to the hiding of neurodivergent traits. And this happens both consciously and subconsciously. So essentially, it's a trauma response for neurodivergent people to feel safe physically and emotionally and to help them operate in society. And in the medical research and literature, we're just now discovering how damaging masking is. And this is where that unmasking movement comes in. So in neurodivergent care, that basically means being your authentic self and asking for accommodations based on your needs, no matter the social or cultural norm. So I this is one of the questions that came up for me after I saw your last lecture. Yeah. So masking is is an interesting... How, how would you define it differently? Because sometimes I think of masking as actually with kids... It also, they develop these workarounds and these other skill sets to sort of mask and they become wizards and, and that help them into adulthood, right? So yeah. it, that's why you see these neurodivergent people be highly successful, right? Because exactly. they've developed these other skill sets to mask or to like, diverge or to however term you want to use um okay. this is something that they are struggling with yes exactly and i actually credit a lot of the success i have had in life with a lot of my masking abilities or what being a high masking individual really taught me how to do the thing that i really work on with people with unmasking and even like for myself looking back is i didn't know i was doing it i didn't know that I had a choice or maybe that I had a different opinion or take on that experience. So a lot of this is just recognizing again and labeling, putting language to that's what I'm doing. That's what's happening. Do I actually want to do that? So like somebody 
a classic version of this with somebody with like autism may be eye contact. They don't love making eye contact notoriously, not something that makes them feel comfortable, increases social anxiety. An autistic person who's high masking has learned tricks and ways to make sustainable eye contact. However, most of the time when they're doing it now, they just do it because I know I'm supposed to do it. I know this person will respond a certain way to me, so I'm going to do it rather than thinking, what is this doing to me? Is this setting my nervous system off? Is this taking a lot of my bandwidth? Am I like feeling well when I do this? Do I want to do this? So it's kind of reconnecting, though, with our own inner compass first before we bring back in all of society, culture, and consequences of these behaviors so the neurodivergent person knows this mask is a choice rather than just who I have to be. And I, I think, uh, I think you know, I've thought about this a lot when people, it seems like when people hit other stages in their life, their ability to mass gets sort of strained, right? Yep. And so you'll, you'll see this. And I, I, I often will see this in patients who come to me for other health reasons, because they're actually, you know, starting to have health problems as a result of their inability to compensate anymore, whether it's whether it's they're, you know, they're putting on weight because they were always exercising and they can't seem to fit that into their their daily routine or they're, you know, they change their diet a lot because for whatever reasons. But it seems like when people hit this, stress, it, it's often at the certain ages. So it's either, it's usually after having kids or their kids hit a certain stage where they can't. But are, are you, where other stages are people doing this at where unmasking becomes a problem and they probably show up on your do doorstep more than mine. Yeah, 100%. So it's basically when there is some sort of other big life stressor that takes away, sucks kind of that bandwidth, or I use the term a lot of times, they're resiliency coins, kind of like yeah. you're playing like a, a video game and you've got those coins that you can like trade in for extra lives. But it's like you run into Bowser and you're Mario and all your coins are gone when you have kids. And that's a huge stressor in life. Maybe you I've got some patients who um, uh, one who had uh, a really bad case of um, food poisoning and just like what that ended up doing to her body was just kind of the catalyst. Then that pushed her into recognizing for a period of time she was living abroad and sick for quite a period of time that really then just made her realize like I don't anymore have like the capacity to mask and take care of my body when it's ill or take care of my kids or anything like that. And what I'm finding though that's really interesting is that is hitting younger and younger. So hmm. I have patients who I've been getting more and more in the ages from about 13 to 19 who are hitting this point where they can't mask anymore. And a big reason of, for this, I think, is that like they there is no hiding from the stressors of the world anymore, no matter your age. And they're already hitting that at that point where they they can't tolerate even that distress there because they're inundated with distressing things constantly. What was the, I'm interested in what, you know, five, 10 years ago, what age were you seeing people at? Was it more college age or? Yeah. Yeah. A few years ago that, or I would say most of my patients probably fell within their thirties to forties. Oh, whoa. Yeah. That's a big change. Yeah. Massive. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. massive. I would say, especially again, post COVID this when I really started getting younger and younger patients. Hmm. That's super interesting. So how do you, how do you think this changes these sort of neurodivergent individuals that are very high achieving, which I, yeah. I feel like I see a lot of these uh, people um, in my practice. What, how do you think their like life path and of like trying to uh, you know achieve goals in their life as their life changes? How do you think that changes for is different for them than it is so neurotypical? Yeah. Patients. So a lot of times the way that neurodivergent minds work is they 
they don't work in a stepwise fashion. They tend to jump steps. So neurotypical brains, if you think of it like you're building a table, they will open up that book to build a table and they will look at step A, then they will look at step B and go from there to the next step. Neurodivergent brains tend to be like, yeah, we don't really care about all that between stuff. Like, where are we going? And then we'll figure out our own way to get there. So what happens to a lot of high achieving neurodivergent people is they get all the way to, if we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the highest level self-actualization. They're really good at just jumping up to living this uh, incredible from the outside self-actualized life with skipping all the steps in between of making sure they had a really good foundation of meeting the lower level Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So their physiological needs, safety, love and belonging, esteem. So I always say when patients come, if I'm thinking about Maslow's hierarchy, it's like their pyramid is unstable. They're living this incredible self-actualized life and doing things sometimes. Sometimes I really think that that pyramid is inverted for people who are neurodivergent. That, yeah. you know, I joke that for me, it's way easier to sit and, you know, deal with a complex patient's, you know, healthcare and medical history than it is for me to go to the grocery store. Yeah. Meeting those. So for those high achievers, it's very backwards. They think, okay, I'm self-actualized. Like doing the laundry should be easy for me. Yeah. And yet these things are the things that most of these high achieving, high masking, very successful individuals are actually struggling with. Yeah. It's the activities of daily living become yep. quite challenging, but the, yep. your ability to do whatever complex other <laughs> uh, high I focus task is <laughs> e much easier. Exactly that. Well, so I wonder, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, co-occurring conditions? This is the thing that really like kind of shook my world in, in talking <laughs> to you, but um, just sort of common, just common conditions that are co-occurring with neurodivergence. Yeah. So we've got a couple of different types of uh physical ailments and mental conditions that both can be common co-occurring condition, co conditions in this group. So when we think about the physical um, issues, we see a lot of autoimmune conditions, cardiac disease, GI diseases, migraines, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, insomnia, dysautonomia, and burnout. If you think of, again, masking, masking being the core trauma response that most neurodivergent people live for throughout their life, they're in then a constant state of sympathetic activation. We are in that state of activation. Again, the tiger is constantly all around us. We're dumping high amounts of norepinephrine, cortisol, high amounts of inflammation, stress-related diseases. We're going to see a lot of that. With the mental side of it, we see a lot of issues with depression, anxiety, feelings of hopelessness, isolation, suicidal ideation, memory lapses, irritability, OCD, whole plethora of things that cross over. And if you do a primary research, like search of neurodivergent and health conditions, you will find a very long list of studies showing those physical health struggles connected to neurodivergent patients, lots of them based around pain, fatigue, and dysautonomia. But the one that you're thinking about, too, that I also find the most interesting is the uh, crossover between uh, neurodivergence and connective tissue disorders and hypermobility spectrum disorders. So we are finding then that. So let me back up for a hot second. And so people who maybe don't know what um, EDS is the acronym or hypermobility spectrum disorders are. So these are genetically inherited disorders of the connective tissue, which means that a patient was going to have symptoms wherever connective tissue is present. So that's almost everywhere in the body then. So lots of symptoms go along with this pain, fatigue, GI discomfort, autoimmune diseases, chronic inflammation, mast cell activation syndrome, joint dislocations, sympathetic overdrive, non-restorative sleep, joy pain, oh, just a hot mess, right? Uh, so these patients, though, another way to think about it, it's like their bodies are floppy and they're constantly working against gravity to hold itself together and to have adequate blood flow to all organs in the body. So the hypermobility part or the ehlers Sandlos part is the core kind of first for this upstream diagnosis. In <laughs> those patients that have this, sometimes secondary, there's tons of other diagnoses that happen. ADHD and autism are two of those that often fall secondary to that. And, you know, we're really in the beginning stages of understanding that. 
But if we look at kind of the the crossover, kind of the concentric circles of what then relates these two to each other, what do those people have in common who maybe have ADHD, autism, secondary to hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, to those who maybe have it primary, is we know people with connective tissue disorders have a different sensory experience of the world due to the connective tissue being very involved in the sensory process. So you would imagine then that somebody who has EDS or HSD also has differences in sensory processing and would have symptoms of autism. As well, when it comes to ADHD, one of the core areas that a lot of people with EDS and HSD struggle with is blood perfusion. So the the veins and the arteries are often also lax. Um, so again, kind of like limp noodles, they need to try to get blood flow up to the brain. Also, when that is lax and a lot of the fluid is sitting in the lower half of the body, we have something happen called the aldosterone paradox, where the kidneys think you're fluid loaded all the time because that fluid is sitting in the lower half of your body, where the kidneys can't tell you actually don't have enough fluid in the upper half of your body. So chronically, people who are hypermobile and have EDS, uh, there's a thought of even that they are walking around with 20% lower fluid volume at any time than they're supposed to be. So if you don't have enough fluid volume and you got loosey-goosey veins and arteries that are really struggling to pump blood up to your brain, let's say you're a student in school and you are not identified as being hypermobile or have EDS, what is it going to look like if you're not getting enough blood flow to your brain? It's going to look like you want to get up and move around. It's going to look like you can't focus. It's going to look like you're struggling to take a test or memorize your times tables whatever. It's going to look like symptoms of ADHD when really that core issue may not just be dopamine, but could also be an issue with blood perfusion. Well, this is, I mean, this is super fascinating because like when I, you know, when I'm, I feel like an old man now, when I was in med school, yeah. like there was basically classic ED, EDS and like classic like EDS. Yep. And I think I maybe learned about vascular EDS. Um, but now in a uh, hypermobile, yeah. Yep. So I think there was like three, four, uh, <laughs> and it seemed more rare. And but that now it seems like I mean, there's I don't know how many types. I think like definitely like close to 15 thirteen different types. Thirteen. Yep. Okay. Yep. 13. thirteen types of EDS. Um, there's and there's you know there's cornea. There's the vascular EDS has become like really terrifying to me because of the yep. uh, blood uh, uh, rupture of before. organs and and vascular uh, it vascular like uh -huh. you know your aorta and other other important blood it's vessels a lot. Uh -huh. it's a lot like but there's there's so many other types now um that and then the relationship with their with patients sensor sensor their their world and the effect that then that has on them from a developmental standpoint but then there's also like this is is now like this massively di delay in diagnosis that happens in so many people. Yeah. And I, I think you said something. It's, it, there's definitely a gender difference there as well. Yes. So there is a huge gender difference. So we have found that the most common place if a patient is not identified uh, with having um, hypermobility spectrum disorders or connective tissue disorders, so the most common place they are sent first is psych. Because yeah. when the nervous system is triggered, it looks like a panic attack. It looks like anxiety. But what a lot of providers forget is that anxiety is a symptom. It's not just a diagnosis. It's a symptom of an activated nervous system, which can happen for biological reasons, biological reasons that are very, very common to happen in people, people who are, are hypermobile. Um, or have EDS. And we know, though, that when that happens, the average delay time to getting diagnosed for men is six years. The average time to getting correctly diagnosed for women is 14 years. Oh, that's 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 crazy to me. <laughs> like, it's absolutely insane. And it, I mean, you can see where like you talk about trauma in neurodivergent patients. I mean, the trauma from the gaslighting um, is is got to be just maddening for pe people, and and then resulting in them feeling like really internally feeling like at some point, especially if you hear that constantly, that you are you can't trust yourself or your body because everybody's telling you what you're experiencing is wrong. Yes, and, and yeah. 
Like, that. So talk, talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So from the time you are tiny, if you are, uh, I sometimes I use the term biodivergent as well to even describe those, because this can even extend beyond, you know, EDS and HSD to those bodies that work different from that algorithmic norm that we're taught in school when we go through. So when you have a body that operates different, when you have a mind that operates different from the time you're tiny, you are given messages that who you are, how you process the world, or how you feel the world around you, that it's not correct. Like a lot of the ones I got, like, Kaylin, no, your shirt's not itchy. Just go to school. You're fine. Yeah. Even though I'm totally focused on like, I can feel every part of my shirt. And, you know, Kaylin in gym class, like you don't get dizzy when you do the bear crawl. You're fine. You're nine. Why would you be dizzy when you're doing the bear crawl? Well, didn't right. know. Had a lot of blood perfusion issues, right? Yes. Yeah. So what that taught me, though, is all the messages my body was giving me were incorrect. So uh, those weren't trustworthy. Everyone else around me knew better for me than I did for how I should be experiencing the world and what that meant, which caused me a lot of problems then when I went through life and got older to not really understand when I wasn't feeling well and how to like accommodate myself. And yes, that gaslighting trauma, we end up seeing then I would say the number one issue that I have to like work with my patients on is fighting that feeling of being misunderstood, fearing that everywhere you go, that trauma response of over explaining because I'm afraid my body's not going to be understood. I'm afraid my mind's not going to be understood especially in healthcare settings. There's a really yeah. interesting study that came out from the University of Indiana also about a year ago around um, provider traumatization of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And part of my own PTSD is related to experiences I had with providers, even though I'm a provider myself, when I was trying to figure out what was going on with my body at the time. So gaslighting in brain, in body, and really intense issues with imposter syndrome um, with the patients that have this experience, as well as the term we'll give it is rejection sensitivity dysphoria, where I would argue I'm not sure that it's dysphoric. I'm sh It's really a uh, reasonable reaction based off of what they've experienced that then becomes yeah. sometimes an overreaction um, later in life because of the many very negative gaslighting experiences these patients yeah. have had. Yeah, so I guess the the next kind of natural question in my mind is is how do we what one so how do we support neurodivergent patients and then and then if you're you know neurodivergent yourself like how do you get it if if there's delay in diagnosis if there's gaslighting in the in the healthcare setting where do you go and how do yeah. you how do you, and how do you help those individuals who are around you or your people you care about to get care? No, that's an awesome, awesome question and really, really difficult. So one of the main things I say, whether you are a colleague, a friend, a family member, a provider, the first thing you need to do is believe their internal experience. What's really difficult about these neurodivergent you know, diagnoses as well as even hypermobility spectrum disorders is a lot of the um, uh, issues, concerns, complaints, they're not measurable in the most yeah, they're objective, not objective. way. It's, mm -hmm. it's subjective, not objective. Yep. And, and anybody in healthcare has a problem with yes. subjective versus objective. We love objective yep. things. Oh, we do. they feel good. It's like a warm blanket. <laughs> yes. Exactly. It feels so, so good. It feels great. Yeah. But like to have this be like, to help a patient, I always, the thing that I remind myself, and I say this to any provider, is to remember that we do not have the authority to help anyone or to name what is helpful to anyone. That is in your patient's hands. So, and that comes from even things that, you know, I would see in medicine a lot. Like, I worked for a while in a Coumadin clinic, and I can't tell you how many times there were meds that, you know, I would look up and be like, no, this shouldn't change your INR. Like, we shouldn't see your bleeding time increase. And then there's their INR, like, shot up to like. And so I, that's an objective piece, but it's the same here where it's like, I have to believe their internal experience. So if I say that, hey, I think cold therapy will be helpful for you, and they come back and say, no, it's not, I have to believe them. Mm -hmm. I don't get to think that I'm right and they're wrong. They have a different sensory experience of the world. So just like if you're in 
the same room as your dog and your dog's freaking out because it smells another dog a few blocks down the way and your nervous system's totally calm, neither of you are wrong. You're having a different experience of that moment in time. That's kind of what it's like being neurodivergent and being hypermobile. So remembering to validate their experience and to believe them. That's numero uno right off the bat. So other things to definitely do are encouraging them to meet their comfort needs, helping them to accept and integrate who they are, not to seek to change it. I have so many patients who come and think that what they're here to do is to be fixed. And again, very, very smart patients. But like, you know, I, I keep thinking about this one who was a healthcare student who was struggling to get into the gym. And he, we had him go and was like, what was the experience like for you? He was like, it was awful because I couldn't find anywhere to park. And then it was awful because I got in there and I was too hot. And then it was awful because everything was sticky or sweaty and I didn't want to touch any of it. This person has EDS uh, and also has actually has classic EDS and then also has ADHD and autism set them up with taking towels in so they could wipe off all the different bars, had ice, did all these accommodations. But the amount of shame and guilt that this person carried for just thinking, but I shouldn't need these things. This shouldn't be who I am. So really helping them accept who they are and supporting that. A huge part of that. Um, the other thing I always say, too, is to really be careful and check our own biases. And especially in, like, as providers, like these biases like affect us, too. We don't even often realize we are being invalidating and dismissive of these patients' complex realities. So to be OK to be wrong and to be OK to mess that up. So yeah. those things, I think, are really important. Yeah. Be accepting, validating, and being okay to be wrong. Yep. Those are just good life advice yep. as in 100%. general. In <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, and I feel like uh, that's a big part of this too is like, so that's the really broad. If I had to get like really nuanced into, especially for providers, is does the intervention benefit the patient or others? That's one big thing. One of those biases that tends to slip up often is when it comes to ADHD and autism, they tend to get diagnosed when it bothers the people around them, not when it bothers the patient. So that's really, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's uh -huh. kind of terrible. <laughs> it's rough. It's pretty rough. <laughs> OK, so yeah, that's important. Where, where do people go, though? Because, yeah, I don't. I, you question. know, like where I mean, because I know like you go through the evaluation process, that in itself can be hard for people. Um what about yeah, where where do you go? Did you hear me there? Now now I can. Sorry you for a oh, second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, um no, I my you know, I, I the evaluation process can be traumatizing in itself. Yes. And and there can be tons of gaslighting around that and mm -hmm. especially you know i know that in, in school systems there's like there's systems set up and maybe they're great maybe they're not but when you get into adulthood there's not like a you can't go to your guidance counselor and be like hey <laughs> i'm struggling and they send you to the you know the person who deals with that at your school yep you know it, i think that exists in some colleges but outside of Outside of that, mm -hmm. where do you go? No, that's a great question. So there are a lot of like uh, testing centers or testing um, uh, sites that are able to kind of, um, they're usually often psychologists who are trained to run through the diagnostic criteria and a certain um different tests to be evaluated for ADHD and autism. Those are the tests that you're talking about that can be very traumatic for a lot of patients, especially those who, again, fall outside of that kind of one patient narrative of what an ADHD or autistic patient looks like. And I have a few who have very much been traumatized by that experience. Um, not to say that everyone isn't some people that may good, be a good match for. The other problem with that is many places, um, those sites are very, very backed up in evaluating those diagnoses, long wait times. I've heard in Canada that there are wait times as long as three years to go through the evaluation process, right? Where you're needing to be accommodated now and it's like, well, let's wait three years to even see if this is what this is, right? Okay. So, and here in the States, there are definitely long wait times too. 
The other issue is those are very expensive. Um, it can cost in the thousands of dollars to go through that evaluation process, which also is, you know, not accessible to everyone. So there's kind of a lot of gatekeeping in that around the diagnosis too. So what other options do you have? A lot of times I'll direct patients to finding a psychiatrist who is experienced in working with adults who have neurodivergent conditions, especially ADHD and autism. So a psychiatrist who's also trained in diagnosing these conditions can do so by meeting with you asking you questions, discussing these things with you, and doesn't necessarily have to only go through this formal testing process, but can diagnose you like they would you stepping into their office and being like, okay, I think you have whatever anxiety, bipolar, whatnot. It doesn't have to be like a test. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and then what about for EDS? Oh gosh. Because, yeah. 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 Oof. <laughs> this one Sorry, I, I, I clearly opened a, a, yeah. a festering wound and poured oh, some salt in it yeah this is this is the bane of my advocacy existence right now um this is so 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 difficult and i'm finding the pushback um uh, and closed doors become actually worse and worse around this um as more and more people, especially, have started to identify themselves with this condition um, or think that they want to be evaluated for this. And here's the big problem is, so 12 out of the 13 kinds of EDS, we know the genetic marker for those conditions. The one that we don't know that for is hypermobility. So with HEDS, generally, when you think somebody may have EDS, you send them to genetics. Genetics, though, many genetic uh, centers across the United States, if a patient only meets the the Baton scale, which is how we um, diagnose people with hypermobility spectrum disorders or hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, they don't want to see them. So then that diagnostics would lie on another provider who is more siloed in our healthcare system. And they have to feel experienced and then willing to do so. And I find that many providers are not comfortable then in doing so. Um, genetics has the most experience with it, but if you don't hit the criteria of possibly having those other kinds, generally genetics won't see you. I had enough symptoms that looked like even when I, I ended up getting diagnosed by a geneticist here in Nebraska, um, I had enough other symptoms that they were like, even when I saw her, she was like, yeah, this looks like classic. Which when I got then my genetic um, results back that were not a match for the 12 out of 13 we knew, I then ended up getting the HEDS diagnosis, which to me just really showed, hey, we really don't know what yeah. HEDS looks like in patients. If this provider with this experience was like, yeah, this looks like classic. Well, if I look like classic and yet I can't get the help or the diagnosis that I need just because of the absence of this marker, there's yeah. a whole lot of issues then that that arrive in that so but, yeah i mean in that setting you have like the the i think it's the brighton score or whatever uh -huh. where you yep. have you know the hypermobility in fingers past yep. certain degrees and and um but you you have that diagnostic criteria that's a that's at least objective but th there's probably from my understanding of these 13 types clear genes that we know and then there's ones we don't know yep. where people meet that i guess uh, maybe findings they find have the findings but they're less objective than a clear score criteria exactly and that's what is making it really difficult is there's still some subjective nature and i'll say even that like um i have and sometimes a little even critical of the the beaten scale like it tests a specific mm. certain joints but also you know hypermobility um and ehlers danlos syndrome is a spectrum unto itself too and some patients those joints may not be the ones that are the most flexible on them and or a lot of patients end up with um overdeveloped muscles in those areas to help make up for those lax ligaments and they can actually be in reverse very very tight i have tons of patients who are like well that can't be me i have really tight hamstrings me too because my hips want to just turn out all the time so i'm really really overdeveloped in my hamstrings always trying to keep my hips from just being turned out I'm gonna, constantly yeah mm -hmm. 
So your your body's own compensation masking me- mechanism yep. kicking in there. But, but you'll see patients with recurrent shoulder dislocations, yep. but yet they don't meet the hypermobile condition or or hip dislocations even. But that that's more extreme. But yeah, yeah. Okay. And I th- and I think the thing that's really if I like what's missing and what needs to really um, uh, be there for us to actually be able to successfully identify and treat um, hypermobile patients is something someone in the healthcare system who is not siloed. And right now that ends up falling on the PCP, but the PCPs do not have the time, do not have the capacity, the ability to spend the time that you need to spend with a hypermobile patient to really be able to help them. So we really need like a, I don't know that there's a patient out there more so than somebody with EDS or HSD that needs holistic care more than those patients do. Yeah. And so the, so that it seems to be the more personalized healthcare approach Mm -hmm. for these individual patients, especially with neurodivergence and with EDS. And obviously there's significant crossover there, um, is, is kind of the way it needs to happen. The, the, you know, the unfortunate part of that is that especially right now that's expensive. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's Mm -hmm. limitations to access. Yep. That's it. Well, so what, what other, uh, it's what are the things do you want people to know about uh, neurodivergence? One of the main things, especially when it comes to providers getting messages out there, those are who I really um, enjoy speaking to, is making sure that you are providing neurodivergent affirming care. So a lot of those things that we talked about before, in addition to patients knowing what is affirming care, because a lot of times neurodivergent patients are just kind of willing to accept again any help because we are not even able to name what's helpful to us. So remembering again that treatment is never to cure the ADHD, autism, neurodivergence. We are not correcting the neurodivergence. And that treatment needs to be deemed successful or it used to be deemed successful if others didn't know the patient was neurodivergent. And that was not even that long ago that we were really aiming like, yay, success story. You wouldn't even know that this person had autism. No. So really that they taught patients how to mask and that creates trauma. So, or there were a lot of negative reinforcements used to incite behavior change. So rather really knowing that this has to be, you know, based around the comfort of the individual. And one of the things that I like to start off any patient doing, and I have anybody do this who needs help really identifying their needs is to ask themselves the question, couple times every day, how could I be more comfortable? Not, am I comfortable? Because most of the time we're like, yeah, 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 I'm fine. But to really, really look and to see and to assess and to check in with your own comfort level. Do I feel okay the way that I'm sitting? Do my hips hurt? Am I kind of hot? Like, uh, do I want water? All of these little, again, basic things that we tend to ignore, push through, and especially, again, if you're neurodivergent, It can be things like, yeah, okay, I'm cold, but I really want to send these eight emails before I get up and go get the jacket. Like we're really commonly like, oh, yeah, yeah, later. Or we'll go and do it and be like, yeah, but I don't want to wear that hoodie because then my hamper is going to be full quicker and then I'm going to do laundry and then I have to put laundry away. I don't want to put laundry away. All of these things, we come up with all of these executive functioning reasons why we can't care for ourselves. So really tapping back into how could I be more comfortable, really working on the interoception of the kind of red and green flag messages that your body are sending you. Hmm. Well, that's, um, well, it's so I just thanks for thanks for coming on with us. We yeah. really appreciate it. And thanks for your lectures to our fellows. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, so it. it and with for people out there, if you have an interest in working with Kaylin one on one or signing up for a newsletter or attending one of her free webinars, uh, head on over to her website. It's kaylinjohnson.com. It's K A L I N J O H N S O N dot com. And um, thanks again for coming on to Wild Health. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. All right. Take care. Thanks. You too. Hey, everybody, a quick note about our precision medicine training program. 
it's been a really popular course. We're constantly hiring health coaches and physicians, but we're only hiring them as we grow if they're trained in precision medicine. You don't get that in medical school or other places. And so we've developed this training program, and we've completely revamped it recently. It's a lot more robust. So now there's still over 50 hours of live synchronous training. There's also all the asynchronous credit, over 50 hours of content. Um, And as a physician, you get about 50 hours of AMA Category 1 CME credit, which is a nice benefit for the health coaches going through the training program. It's now accredited by the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching. So graduates are going to meet the requirement to sit for the board exam and become board-certified health coaches. There's a lot of benefits to that, not just certification, but also when it comes to things like insurance reimbursement. So it's a really robust program. If you're a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or someone that just wants to be a health coach, um, it's open to all of those categories. There's the six-month program that's kind of the full program. And then we also have just a fundamentals of precision medicine course, which is completely on your own. It's online. It's all asynchronous. You still get the 50 hours of AMA Category 1, but it's self-paced. And you still have access to the online community, but not all the synchronous lectures as well. So if you're interested in checking that out, go to wildhealth.com forward slash education. And we'd love to have you as part of our next class.